name is Tom Alpel, I'm the founder and director of Green University here in Pony, Montana. I don't know about you, but whenever I go to the grocery store, I'm always shocked at how expensive meat is. It is crazy expensive. And not only that, but the quality is, is questionable. You never know, is the meat full of uh, antibiotics and, and uh, growth hormones? Fortunately, there is an alternative. You'll often pass a perfectly good uh, roadkill game on the side of the highway, maybe even on your way to the grocery store or out to go hunting. And so that's what we're going to do today, is to go through the step-by-step -step process for butchering roadkill deer so you can fill your freezer with all-natural, wild and free organic venison. Roadkill laws vary a lot from state to state. Here in Montana, there was never any law against picking up a roadkill game, and people traditionally did. Uh, I've even talked to old-timers who mentioned being fed roadkill venison in school. Uh, on the other hand, there was never any law stating that it was legal to pick up roadkill game, and over time it was increasingly interpreted to mean that it wasn't legal to pick up roadkill game. Uh, fortunately, a few years ago, the Montana legislature formally legalized uh, the use of a roadkill game including deer, elk, antelope, and moose. And it's a great system. It's uh, All that's required is a, a free permit. The, uh, you just When you get home, you go online and uh, you fill out a tag that lets the state know what was picked up and you know where it was found. It helps them better track uh, the wildlife and wildlife issues. So uh, be sure to investigate the uh, roadkill laws in your state before you pick up game. Now there's one feature about my Subaru that uh, I really like and I want to share that with you here. And that's that it has this nice rubber mat in the back. Uh, so you can put a, a deer in here and it uh, you know, contains any messes from blood or from uh, any manure or anything that uh, spills out. And all you got to do is just uh, take this out and clean it. It also has this uh, nice rim around the edge uh, that helps to contain spills. Back to our deer here, uh, you know I always hate to see animals get killed on the roads and unfortunately it's just a fact of life here in Montana because we do have a lot of wildlife and so there are a lot of uh, car and wildlife uh, collisions. I also hate to see things go to waste and so ideally you want to pick up a roadkill as fresh as possible, within a few hours is great, however it doesn't always happen that way. In this case I picked it up uh, last night and uh, it had been laying there probably all day, possibly even since the night before. Uh, however, it is uh, March here, it's still winter in Montana, so you know, it's been well refrigerated. And uh, you know, it's a little, it's a little stiff, uh, but overall in uh, pretty good shape. And um, you know, eyes are still uh, clear there. And uh, so there'll be some good meat that we can salvage off this deer. Hey, I'm Kenny. I'm going to be butchering this deer right here. First, we're going to make the cuts. Well, you want to cut around all the joints of the legs. So here, here, here. And then, you want to join those cuts. I follow the color of the hair all the way down to the butthole. The entire process of skinning and butchering roadkill deer is included in vivid step-by-step -step photos in my book, Foraging the Mountain West. Try and utilize the closest point of the knife, because that's where I have the most control for knife safety. Now I'm making the front leg cut, find the joint. And again, I follow a different hair colored line to the center of the chest. Most people would cut straight down the middle on the inside of the front leg. However, by following the hair color, uh, Kenny is producing a hide that is more square and therefore nicer for tanning. This is a roadkill deer and it was hit over here because this leg's broken. It's usually not this 
flimsy. There is remarkably little damage to this deer. It has the broken front leg, and it was apparently killed by blunt force trauma to the head, which is ideal when dealing with roadkill game. I'm going to cut the neck all the way around, basically at the base of the ears. You don't want to go too deep, or else when you hang your deer, the head will just come off. So you just want to cut the skin. Note the trauma to this side of the face where the deer was hit by the car. Now I'm going to be cutting the line down the center. Butchering an animal and dealing with blood and guts can be a pretty emotionally traumatic experience if you've never done it before. However, once you get through the first one or two, then it's easy after that. You don't want to point your knife down into the stomach and cut, because then you might cut open the intestines and then poo will get all over your meat. Usually you hold the knife like this and do it. I guess I can do. So you don't want to cut that the intestines. Ooh, yeah. This is a method that I read in a book. It's the shove and stick. It's where you shove your knife on the outer edge of the anus and cut around it. Pull it out a couple inches and then tie it so that way poo doesn't come out. See, I can pull out the anus now. Every person that butchers game develops their own process for it. If this were me, I would have hung the deer first, then removed the four lower legs, then made the cuts, skinned the deer, and finally gutted it. And that's the beauty of it, is that there isn't a specific right or wrong way to do it. Any way you can muddle through it is fine, and there's no need to be intimidated by the process. So I'm cutting up the side of the ribs. You don't want to cut in the middle because that's just pure bone, but you cut it on one side all the way. So I like to see what I'm doing, so I grab a stick and I wedge it in to open up the rib cage. I need to learn more about anatomy. There we go. I'm going to just grab the heart right now. Usually you save the liver too to eat. Liver. There's this uh, lining that separates the upper organs from the lower organs. You go ahead and cut that. There's a whole bunch of blood pull up. Don't be too worried. The organs are connected to the spine in the back. You can just take your knife, be careful, and slice away. You can just make a little slice and use your hands to get it out. So I just pulled out the anus with that shove and pull. Here's the anus. No poo came out. They tied it off. Usually people don't tie off the anus and they kind of just yank it through and it just breaks and poo just goes over a lot of stuff. So as you can see the only thing hanging up or the only thing keeping this all these intestines up is the throat. We're going to take off the hide, just using our hands, sometimes a knife. We're going to start the neck and pull, using gravity, pull down. So, 
I want to tan this lady's hide and I want the hide to be in one piece and without we call them score marks when the when you accidentally slice slice the skin with your knife. Let me help you with your coat, ma'am. Do you want to tan your own hide? Step-by-step -step instructions are included in my book, Participating in Nature, Wilderness Survival, and Primitive Living Skills. A lot of meat on here. I'm going to try and... You can sometimes cut off or pull off the hide without meat on it. Just got to kind of coerce it. stick anymore. It's way easier taking off a hide when it's fresh than when it's old. So you're saying this is old? This is older. Okay. So you can see now that I'm just pulling the skin off without any meat on it. where he was hit by a car, broken, bone. It's really hard on the fingers if you try and dig them with your fingers. I'm still working on not doing that, but try and use your fist. Eventually you can get to your elbows. I don't want to get this dirty though. Great workout. It's better than a gym. So I'm done. Done uh, taking off the hide of the deer. Here it is, a nice whole piece ready for tanning. This deer looks pretty good. It's a couple days old, but the cold weather kept it from rotting that much. You can see it's turning a little green here, a little maybe green there, but nothing that I would worry about. So, either bend the hocks at the joint. And then cut into them carefully. Roadkill venison makes up a significant part of the diet here for our Green University students. People who come here develop proficiency in all aspects of the process, from uh, skinning and butchering to tanning hides and making their own clothing, developing a job-free lifestyle. Go to the website and check out the offerings to see if you'd like to join us here at Green University. The back legs include a more complicated joint that requires a bit of feeling around to work your way through it with a blade. So, always work through the joint. There's tendons that connect these joints that once cut, it's easy to twist off and break. This tendon keeps it on pretty well, so we'll just cut that off. Before we moved inside, Kenny went ahead and fleshed and scraped the hide to prepare it for tanning. Now we're going to quarter the deer, take off the limbs, and just separate it into smaller pieces that can fit in the kitchen. The front legs are pretty easy to get off. They have to just like just start cutting off. It's not connected by a joint. It's connected by 
don't even know what to call it. But that was easy. Now when you're doing the lower leg, it's key to just follow the bone and work your way around the bone. See, I'm hitting bone, so I'm working my way down. This is a hard, usually this is where I got stuck is at the ball joint. Coarsely cut that joint out. But if you, you don't know about that ball joint, it could be a real pain to get this off. There's the leg. To remove the back straps, start by cutting down along both sides of the backbone. You could work out the back straps with your hand. If you leave the back straps in place, you can cut across the vertebrae with a saw to make T-bone stakes, but that is a lot more work. This is the best part of the deer. Let's get the tenderloins inside the deer, which are these two right here. You can start by making a little slit on top. Pretty tender, so don't pull too hard. I think I wasted a lot. See how easy it is to just rip it off? Let's take off all this flab. Probably could have done that sooner. But how will you use that? Um, that's a good question. I think I'm gonna just, uh, depending on how much fat is on here, I can either cut it into stir fry pieces or maybe hang it up for jerky. We are already at the point where many hunters would just throw the rest of this carcass in a dumpster and I find that really disturbing and morally wrong. So I'm glad to see Kenny uh, looking for ways to utilize uh, every little scrap of this beautiful deer. If you hit a bone, stop cutting. Find a way around the bone or else your knife will be dulled quickly. And with these you can just make enough cuts around the muscle to easily snap it. These bony chunks can be bagged and frozen to use as boiling bones to flavor soups and stews. In Kenny's case the plan is to boil all of the bones together for an extended time to make some nourishing bone broth. So just cut all the muscle off or through the muscle and then it's easy to snap. take off as much meat as I can, or uh, stir fry meat, I can just cut up the cube, just following the bone. Here our methods are significantly different. Uh, I would leave the meat on the neck and on the ribs, I would save the neck as a roast, 
and I would cut the ribs off with a meat saw to be cooked up as a rack of ribs. Yet here again, uh, any technique works, and one way is just as good as another. Hunters often throw racks of ribs in the dumpsters loaded with meat, and even the wild game processors don't process the ribs unless the customers ask for it. Because of this, my friends Chris and Bartle were able to salvage enough meat to can 400 quarts of venison this last fall, all that meat without firing a single shot. Just rinsing it off, getting uh, getting any poop or pee that might have gotten on it, or intestines. Just give it a nice rinse. This is coagulation that can also be taken off. I don't need that. Alright, so the bone goes like this. You can just cut in and just take this whole part out. That's what I'm going to do. You can see where muscle is and just kind of follow it. Go down to the bone, turn, and go down. You hit bone, go around it. Then you just follow bone. This muscle that's just connected, I'm just cut it with it just because it's part of that muscle. There isn't much fat on this dough. Uh, she'd been burning her fat reserves all winter long, and now that it's almost spring, there isn't much fat left to burn. First cut. As you can see, it's just following the bone. Then you take the back. Start up here, cut in, and then go down the bone. Make sure the sides are cut off, just so I get a bigger piece of meat for jerky in. Called a di another type of steak. Don't know mm -hmm. what it's called. <laughs> this meat has a lot of sinew in it. It's not very good for jerky, but I'm gonna just chop it up in pieces for a stir fry. You don't want uh, you don't want the sinew in it. And cut that off. Feed it to your dog. The rest of this goes into a crock pot for bone broth. The mussels, they run this way, so I'm going to cut this way to make the steaks. These knives are pretty dull, and it would make sense to stop and sharpen them, but with a little sawing back and forth, they do go through the meat. What I'm doing is separating the muscles just to get nicer steaks. Look at that. All natural, raised in the wild, 100% organic venison steaks. And it's all free for the taking. If it were up to me, I would turn the entire deer into steaks and roasts for the freezer. However, Kenny claimed this deer, so this is all the steaks I get. He's going to turn the rest of the deer into jerky.
the steaks are cut, so I'm going to just pile them up, throw them in a bag. Any old bag will work. There's no need to go out and buy freezer wrap to package your meat. Recycled plastic bags work just as well. Uh, bread bags are my personal favorite. Just be sure to label them so you can identify what's in your freezer. If you're making jerky, I do the process is a lot slower because I you have to remove all the fat from the muscle and I and I separate the muscles more carefully so that way I can hang them in bigger pieces to be dried. I used to cut these in really s small th slices but I switched to just cutting huge uh, fat pieces, slabs, slabs. There's one slab. These little miscellaneous pieces just go in a jar for a uh, later. Like I think this may be a little too fat. Just go back and uh, cut it in half. There we go. There's a whole slab to hang up. To make this jerky, uh, Kenny is literally making dried meat. Uh, no spices, no marinating. Uh, just hang it up on the string over this cook stove to dry it out. So there's a lot of scrap pieces that aren't really good for big pieces of jerky. So I'm going to just cut these up into to squares and throw them in a jar. And for for stir fries. When they're in a jar, at least a canning jar, I can can them. Um, these are just quick meals that I like to do. The lower leg muscles, so the thighs of an animal, are really tough. And those are, I think, the most, the meat that should be cut up into squares for easy eating and cooking, in, in my opinion. Which of these has lots of sinew in it. Oh, that's a beautiful looking piece of meat there. Yeah. Is that um, off, all soft the hind quarter? Or? Yep. Mm -hmm. In the middle of all this meat processing, Kenny has been continued to work the deer hide, here stretching it open to better absorb the brains that he salvaged from the head. The brains contain lecithin, an oil that will help to soften the hide. Um, but I'm just uh, cutting in between the ribs uh, for some good bacon meat, or I suppose you could dry it out. Trimming off every little scrap of meat like this is very labor intensive. However, it does make a higher quality product than merely roasting the rack of ribs.
All of these rib bones will be saved for making bone broth. Cut this, cut that, cut, cut, cut. Um. Working with all this beautiful meat, we just couldn't wait to cook some up, so we started with chopped venison heart, fried in butter. Mmm, -mm, talk about delicious. Mm -hmm. Backstrap sinews are prized for sewing, for sinew backing bows, and for making bowstrings if you want to save them. Use the back end of the knife to get it off so you don't cut the sinew if you want to use it. Just kind of slide. I like cutting butterfly steaks from the back straps as discussed in my book Foraging the Mountain West. However, for Kenny's purposes, cutting long strips works great for his growing jerky forest hanging above the cook stove. Well, this looks really black. Great for dogs. Look how much coagulation is on this mm. broken leg. Cut off the fat. Cut off the quag. To the chickens. The front quarters can be quickly split apart into three sections, making two nice small roasts and one boiling bone. In this case, however, uh, Kenny is deboning everything in order to cut strips for making jerky. The leftover bones are added to the pile for making bone broth. Here is the front shoulder blade. And now we have more jerky to hang up above the wood stove. It'll dry quickly from the heat of the fire and be ready in just a few days, preserved to last a long, long time.